Uh, some questions from our libertarian network via Facebook, mm -hmm. uh, from our friends. Uh, Gordon asked, asked, I, I so, should probably tell you that when people ask me to friend them on Facebook, mm -hmm. if their posts are all in a language I don't read, I almost always decline. Oh, okay. It's a waste of time. Mm -hmm. That I have, Good to know. I have a mild prejudice in favor of people from countries I don't know anything about because okay. I can learn something. Okay. But I, ju the main way I decide who to, what friend requests to accept, is by the combination of whether they post, mostly or whether they post interesting things, because I look at their mm -hmm. their past posts, mm -hmm. uh, and whether they are in a language that I can easily read. There are a number of foreign languages that I can read with great difficulty, but I don't usually friend those people either, mm -hmm. because I'm not actually going to read them. Good to know. Um, Gordon Arso asks, in your ideal anarcho-capitalist world, uh, who resolves complaints on court decisions? Like if there's a com complaint on, on a decision that a court made? That, that would depend on how the court system is structured. That in a way, that's like saying in my ideal capitalist world, how will automobiles be built? And the answer is, I have no idea. I don't build automobiles. <laughs> so you can imagine a system where what the two rights enforcement agencies agree on is a court which will have no appeals. So that you might imagine a system where the final decision settles it. If the customers don't like that arrangement, you could then imagine one where part of the contract is we go to court A. If the parties don't like the verdict from court A and are willing to pay the cost of another trial, we will agree on court B, which might be another court that settles things between other agencies. It might be a court that specializes in appeals. So you could certainly, you could have a system of appeals under that system. And whether you did would be a market outcome. It would depend on whether customers prefer a system in which you get the matters settled quickly, with not having appeals does, or whether they prefer a system where if the court makes mistakes, you've got ways of correcting them. Sao Gaich asks, since your theory supports the non-aggression principle from the consequentialist angle, does the non-aggression principle apply to children? In other words, is aggression towards children in every form forbidden? No, not in every form if the children are small enough. I would have said that if your two-year-old is trying to walk out into busy traffic, you grab him and pull him back, even though that looks like aggression if it were done between adults. What I think is true is that it is, for consequentialist reasons, prudent to engage in much less aggression to children than most people do. So that, for example, the children of my present marriage were unschooled, where unschooling is an approach to education in which the children themselves decide what to do. Uh, that the they were first unschooled in a small private school that was run on very unconventional lines and then home unschooled. So that meant that we were not telling our children, here is what you must learn today. We were rather telling, talking with them. <laughs> and if they were saying, here is an interesting book you might like to read, and if they read the book and had questions discussing it, uh, here are some interesting ideas you might want to think about, and letting the children control their own time almost entirely, uh, subject to the fact that if you're all living in the same family, you can't go to different restaurants for dinner, uh, you, our rule for eating was that the children did not have to eat what we were making, but they had to eat something reasonably nutritious that was no extra trouble for us. So that our son, for a while, always had us have containers of yogurt in the refrigerator because he liked flavored yogurt. It's pretty good for you. And so if whatever we were having for dinner was something he didn't like, he could have yogurt instead. Later, it was uh, pot pies that he could make himself in the microwave oven. Uh, but so that, in general, I think it is sensible to minimize aggression against children. And as the children get older, minimize really means close to nothing, except for the fact that they're living in your house eating your food. It's not clear it's really aggression if you say, here are the terms on which you can live with us. Uh, but I would say that literal aggression, except for very small children, is almost never never necessary. And incidentally, Adam Smith agreed with me, although in a less extreme fashion. 
In The Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith is discussing education. And his comment is that it may be necessary in the case of small children to compel them to attend the classes where they learn the rudiments of education. But that beyond the age of 11 or 12, compulsion need play no role in education. That no compulsion is needed to make children attend those lectures that are worth the attending, as is known where such lectures are given. And this is part of his a discussion in The Wealth of Nations, where he's trashing the Oxford-Cambridge University system in favor of the Scottish system, where professors were paid directly by the students. Now, would that go hand in hand with the Rothbard's argument that, for example, small children should be should have the right to run away from their parents as soon as they are able to? I would say that as soon as they are able to is probably carrying it too far. But I would say that uh, a 12 year old who really doesn't want to live with his parents probably should not have to. Uh, and if there are other parents who want to adopt him and he's willing to be adopted, that ought to be fine. If he can support himself, uh, that ought to be fine. And I, in fact, made that argument. I have no idea whether I made it before or after Rothbard did, but it isn't the first edition of Machinery of Freedom, which would be 1972 is when that was published. I'm not an expert on Rothbard's writing, so I can't tell you which of his books he made the argument in when. Okay. Um, Kronoslav Gashparic asks, is there anything at all that we could use the state for? In other words, do you have any mercy for the state? The answer is there are useful things the state does. The problem is how you could set it up so the state only did those things. Uh, that uh, there, I have a discussion in some detail in the new chapters for the third edition of what I refer to as market failure on the market for law. Ways in which my system would produce imperfect law. And if you had a wise, benevolent sort of philosopher king, he could do better than that. Uh, so in that sense, there are things the state could do that would be useful. And there are things the state does do that are useful. But the problem is that what the state does ends up being decided by the state, and the state generally has incentives to do a lot of things where it is not useful. So uh, that's, I think, the answer is not. I think it's too, it's too strong a claim for, for anarchists to say the state is of no use, that the claim you really want to make is a net claim, not a gross claim, which is to say the state produces some benefits but larger costs.